Well, let's get started again. So I know I know I made some of you squirm in your seat when we started talking about loading a truck that way, because that's different than what you're used to. It doesn't take any longer because the same amount of potatoes come off the harvester in a given amount of time. So whether that truck's sitting and build a pile and just barely creeping and going to the back or going to the forward uh, doesn't change the load time. What it does change is the amount of damage that's in the crop by the time it's in the truck. And, and that's a significant item. So one of the challenges with, with the pile, well, wherever you are with it, um, the boom can be right close to the pile on the trailing side. But there's going to be a drop over on this side that's a little greater than that. And that's more difficult with the bigger harvesters. In the West, uh, there's hardly anything but four row diggers being run anymore. And so their boom is about this wide. So when the front edge is right on the lip of that pile, the back edge has about this much of a drop to it. And uh, that, that's a concern. They haven't figured out a way to, to mitigate that problem yet. Our machine, the boom is almost 40 inches wide. Okay, all right. So, that's our, that's one of our limits. All right. Um, it typically causes a lot of damage when you try to squeeze things narrower. So if you were to try to squeeze that boom down to 30 inches, there would be some issues there that would be counterproductive to the bruise free effort. So I wouldn't suggest that you try to narrow that, that tip because of that kind of a problem. The, um, there's several places on the harvester where bruising is commonly occurring. Uh, let me see if I can illustrate some of those. I'm going to leave this, this eight inches here because that doesn't change. That's the tolerance a potato has. The higher the gravity of the potato, the less vulnerable it is to bruise. Low gravity potatoes have a higher portion of water versus dry matter, and they're more fragile. And that varies by variety. It varies by cultural practices, length of season, soil type, Fertility, water management, all those things have an effect there. And so there isn't a hard and fast rule that one can say, okay, I gotta have such and such a gravity to be happy with it. In fresh pack, it's not a particularly important issue. In processing, it is. Because the blanch time, once they cut the potato into fry strips, they run them through a hot water blanch. And what that does is it leaches the sugars on the surface of the fry strip away. That hot water just dissolves them and pulls them away and then they run them into the fryer after they're dried so the fryer will give you an even golden colored surface on your french fry. You've seen fries that are kind of brownish to one end or one side. That's the sugars that didn't get blanched away. Uh, the sugars caramelize in the heat and that's why they they're have that color and those sugars are not sucrose or table sugar they're reducing sugars like fructose and glucose you take a sucrose split it in half with an enzyme you get one fructose and one glucose and that's the ones that give you the color problems in fries so in a fresh situation you don't have to worry about that 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 problem just goes away but on the harvester the first big problem occurs at the base of the primary chain, that horizontal knife down there that slides through the soil. You want the surface of that knife, let's, let's draw it like this. It's, it's usually just a piece of flat steel. You want that surface exactly in line 
with the surface of this primary chain. You don't want a, a steep slope up here and then flat. You want it straight like that. If you put a steep slope, the potatoes get to the top and they'll, they'll drop into this nose area here and the compression bruises them. So we want a straight line. You can take a piece of a, a two before or a board off a pallet or a straight edge or a broom handle, whatever you're comfortable with, lay it on there and make sure we got a nice smooth straight line there. If it isn't, adjust either this or this. So that's, that's really important. We can do 15 to 20 percent bruise right here if these aren't lined up. So it, it's kind of a big issue. Then when we get to the top of the primary, we have a free fall onto the secondary. Now, how many of you carry a little extra dirt on your primary for cushioning? Okay. Problem is, it doesn't work. So let me illustrate that. We've got uh, our potatoes are, are here in the ground, and this is the top of our hill. So we're picking all this up and, and heading it up, up the primary chain. So we've got soil below the lowest potatoes. We don't want to be cutting them. And then we've got soil around the potatoes and above them. Now, what we're doing here with that primary and the way it should be set for speed is, in a sense, stretching that row out. The primary chain runs faster than your ground speed in a ratio of about 1.2 to 1.6 times your ground speed. If you have very nice dry soils that will fall through the chain quite easily, you can do it real well with a 1.2, just slightly faster than ground speed. If your soils are a little on the heavy side, more clays or silts in them, or they're fairly wet, then you're going to have to stretch it out even more to get the soil to fall through. So we get up there to 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 times ground speed. So that's what we're doing is we're just stretching that hill out so we can let the soil through. Now, as that becomes uh, a load up here on the primary, the soil below the sea, this soil in here, is the first to fall through. That puts our potatoes that are in the bottom of the hill right on the chain. As that soil falls through, the soil on either side or around that potato can fall through. So by the time it gets up to here, a lot of this soil on the side is, is disappearing through the chain. <coughs> and then there's potatoes on top of it. And by the time you get up near the top of the primary, within 18 to 24 inches, you want to be looking at the top side of every potato in that load. We don't want dirt on top of the potatoes when they make the fall to the secondary. Because Here's your potato. Now you put this much dirt on it. Now it's twice as heavy when it falls and hits the chain on the secondary. It's that much harder. So we want to clear that dirt out so that in that last little ways on the top, all those potatoes kind of look like they're rising up out of the soil. Well, in reality, the soil is falling through. And the potatoes can't get through because they're too big for the size of the chain. So we don't want to carry soil over that drop into the secondary. Because that's another place where a significant amount of damage can occur. Now, how does that is that what you do, or I, I don't know? Well, that's different than my thought process was, but I came here to learn. So, okay. But, but, but traditionally, I have had the opinion that if we carried some clay, turn up the side elevator, that would be that would be cushioned with a 
potatoes. But in this theory, that your theory is different than my thought process was. Okay. But, but that's okay. All that's right. What I'm here for. Well, new ideas. Yep. You can't make a change until you get one. But what, just in ground speed there, you use 1.2 to 1.6 and the formula is fine. I guess it depends on the conditions, but it what does. have you seen the variations in heart speed in, in ground speed? Basically, your side elevator and your boom have the least flow capacity. You can't overload those or you get rollback and uh, that's problems too. So the amount of potatoes on your side elevator, you want a full chain, but not an overfull. So you got flights on there to help keep them going. And if they get too deep, they'll just start tumbling back. Now some diggers have hugger belts on them to avoid that and others don't. Uh, either way, uh, you don't have a hugger belt on the boom, which is about the same width as your side elevator generally. And so when the boom's up high, when you've almost got a full load, you got another pretty steep slope. So your ground speed through the field is going to be a function of your yield. How fast can we go and not overload our narrowest chains? And, and that's, that's the limiting factor. Now, where you're using a side caster to bring some extra rows over to get more potatoes on the machine, um, that changes your ground speed versus digging a, a row by itself. But uh, the side caster adds potentially some damage because you're handling the potatoes twice. Now, the, if the chain on the side caster is in line with the bottom knife, then that, that works pretty good. And you just have one drop at the back and then a, a cross conveyor to bring them over. So again, pay attention to this eight inch rule where you have that drop at the top of the primary. Generally what we find is we want this secondary chain or that rear cross to be up as close as we can get it without the risk of the two hitting each other. Because that'll either wear them out real quick or it'll cause a wreck. You'll, you'll wrap up a bunch of chain. That's not a fun day. So we want to keep this drop as small as we can. Now if your machine has a diviner, down here you want that diviner chain laying right on the secondary. It's there on purpose. A lot of them came from the factory with four, five, six inches of clearance. And, and that was too much of a drop. This, this drop from here down to here was too much. We exceeded the bruise sensitivity level of the potatoes. We caused damage. So a lot of the newer machines, they've, they've changed that because of that issue. So on the side caster, the rear cross, some of them are pretty much level, some of them are sloped to the rear. If you have one that is sloped to the rear, the idea is to get potatoes to move further back so they're not all on the front edge and get sucked back under and drop to the ground. So you want them to get off the primary and away from that transition point uh, onto that rear cross chain. Now, the challenge there is on that rear cross, that back side wall is steel. And potatoes, particularly the big ones that tend to have a little more inertia, will go back and hit that back wall. And that causes damage. Bigger potatoes are much more difficult to handle without bruise than our small ones. And so that's particularly where the inspectors or anybody that's working on a bruise concern is going to be looking. They'll look at the big potatoes and see if they're okay. If they're good, they're all good. Now on the back wall of that rear cross, we can take a piece of belting. It could be this thin or it could be regular quarter inch thick belting that you've got laying around old used stuff, doesn't have to be new, that came off a machine because the edges got wore out. Take it and fold it into a teardrop shape like that. That leaves some, some flex in there. So you put that across the back wall of the 
rear cross on the side caster. So the potatoes that do get back there, they hit this, it gives a little stop so when they aren't damaged. Now this will tend to go flat like that in not too long a time, a couple weeks and it'll be pretty flat. To avoid that, we take a piece of this water pipe foam insulation, stick it inside there. Now it won't go flat. And that'll last all season, sometimes several years. And when it finally gets wore out, you pull it out, put a new piece in. So it's a fairly inexpensive way to address an impact surface that a lot of our bigger potatoes can be hitting when we're side casting them. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cross the rear back wall of the rear cross of the digger, and on the outboard side where the rear cross delivers into the side elevator, there are impacts there. You can look, the paint's all wore off there. Well, it didn't just fall off; it got rubbed off. So potatoes are hitting it. Any place the paint's gone, that's a pretty good sign. There's something going on there called contact, and contact causes damage. So any of those changes of direction points at the front wall at the top of the side elevator where they go across the picking table. You can put that cushioning there as well. Now if you happen to have one of those machines that has the star rollers up at the top of the elevator to help eliminate more dirt, and they, they do that, they typically, because of their flexing fingers, the potatoes look like they're dancing like popcorn up there. That takes a lot of the skin off, especially if it isn't really well set yet, and it can cause some damage. You don't want potatoes to get airborne, ever, because they can't do a thing for separating when they're flying in the air. They gotta be down on the surface, them and the soil you're trying to separate to make it work. So we don't wanna, wanna see, uh, if you have one of those, slow it down so it's just a flow across it. It's just another hole for dirt to get through that uh, didn't make it through on the primary or the secondary. Brian. Some of the new spud nicks here on the island, they have a, the nose is tilted right down. There's like a steep part on the front. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of that? Does, that? does that help to? Well, in theory, it's supposed to have less wear on the bottom side of the primary chain where it's coming against the direction of travel so it's wearing in the soil before it makes the loop and goes uphill. But when you have those out of line like that, you're creating a lot of compaction. And the gentler you lift that hill and stretch it out on the primary, the less damage you're gonna see. Now those have several holes in the frame, so you can pull the bolts, tip that, and put them in at an angle where you want them. So they're, they're adjustable for several ways. They may put them that way when they ship them because it's slightly shorter machine. Well, Don't know. The ones are hydraulic controls. You can adjust it on the fly. Okay. Are they? Okay. Uh, but yeah. It's pretty steep right at the front. Like it's pretty steep right at the very Well, you, you want a straight line flow. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of studies with uh, the electronic instrumented sphere, which is a round ball with some gravity or impact sensor mechanisms in there. Tells you how hard things are hitting go out and bury that in the ground, come through with a digger, catch it up the top of the primary. And we could see substantial differences in the energy of compression when they didn't line up, the primary knife and the primary chain. So from a bruise concern, that's important. <clears throat> the big issue with the side caster is getting the potatoes back on the ground. Most of those machines allow for some free fall because they're trying to clear the row as they go down so they don't want rigid stuff down there dragging in the next row and hurting the potatoes there. So that's a challenge. Putting a piece of belt, fairly heavy belt, some guys use 3 8 some guys use half inch. Uh, like mud flap thickness belt to let those potatoes slide down to the furrow where they're going to rest until the digger comes through and picks them up. 
So we don't want free fall. You can slide them down, and that, that's okay. That doesn't hurt them much. But if you let them drop, then there's a possibility of some damage there. And the bigger the drop and the bigger the potato, the more penalties there are from that. So in, in the West, they have different conditions, a longer season and so forth, so they get bigger yields. I haven't seen a side caster in the Columbia Basin in Washington in probably close to 20 years. If they were to side cast four rows over and dig eight at a time, potatoes would be about this deep in the side elevator. <laughs> These can't do it. They can fill a semi going down and halfway back in most fields, and, and down is um, about 2,000 feet. They're 100 acre circles roughly, so they're about 2,000 feet in diameter. And uh, so they go down one pass and halfway back, and, and a eight, uh, an 18 wheeler semi is full. Yeah, on four rows. On four rows. So they're, they're getting bigger yields, and that's because they got a longer season. They start planting. Uh, in those full season things uh, last week in March and they'll be digging them until probably the first week in November and so some of those have got 180 growing days and, and you can make things happen with another month of bulking just think what your crop could do you know because most of your yield is in the last six or seven weeks by the sometime in July you finish growing your canopy and from then on you're making tubers Add another month to that, and wow, that, uh, that really matters. So on the side caster, that drop back to the ground is the biggest issue. The back wall on the rear cross would be the second most important issue. The third one would be making sure these down at the bottom of the primary line up so that it's a nice straight line. And, and that should take care of most of those issues. The side caster should not travel through the field any faster than the harvester does. The faster you move potatoes, the more velocity they have on all parts of the equipment. And when they're changing direction or hitting each other, the energies of impact are greater. So one side caster can't keep up with two diggers. It just, you can't, can't make it work and still have the bruise free that you're looking for. I don't know whether you use one for two or two for two or what you do there. Um, after we worked on the planters this year, do you have any sense that your plant stand was any different than previous seasons? Uh, there's no comparison to our plant stand this year to what we had previous to that. Okay, all right. Now, yeah, that's, okay. that's going to do a couple things for you. One, a lot of those oversized potatoes are coming from the plants on either side of a skip. So a lot of those bigger potatoes, the real hard ones to handle without damage, you're not going to see. Because the spacing is more uniform, the available resources to support growth, water, fertilizer, sunlight, is going to be more appropriate for each plant in the field. So you're going to see a, my guess, a tighter size range. Fewer oversize, fewer undersize, more middle size. By middle, I'm going to say 5 to 10, 11, 12 ounces, somewhere in that range. And uh, those are going to be easier to handle than those 14, 16 ounce potatoes that often come from a plant next to a skip. So that's going to help your bruise significantly all by itself. 
And uh, so once you've dug a few acres in different fields, you'll get a sense of what's out there and how similar or different it is from previous seasons. general rule of thumb, anything you can do production-wise with seed cut from larger tubers. By larger, I mean 9, 10, 11, 12 ounce sizes. You can do easier, cheaper, and more profitable from the smaller potatoes in that same seed lot. From my way of thinking, if, if I were going to go out and farm like you guys are doing, I'd be inclined to go ask for a six and a half ounce top. Now, Seeger is going to fall out of his chair when you tell him that. That's not what he's growing. It's not what he's used to. But a six and a half ounce potato only gets cut in half. And I would ask him to put anything below an ounce and seven eighths in his own field rather than send it to you. Because those real small ones are mostly late set. They formed middle of the summer and didn't have very much time to develop and accumulate stored energies, sugars, starches, carbohydrates. So there isn't much reserve there for a new plant to work with. And here where you have a uh, 120 day season or something like that, average, typical? Okay. Late set potatoes aren't going to be mature enough to give you strong vigor. So those single drops in your situation, this region, are not going to give you everything they should. If you had a plant with a whole bunch of little ones under it, they'd been there all summer, they're great. You can't beat them. They're going to give you better yields than anything else. Because when you cut seed, that cut surface needs to heal or it decays. The healing process requires energy. That energy comes from the stored reserves within the seed piece. So the more cut surface you have and the more area, the more energy gets partitioned into healing that seed piece up and the less is left for the new plant to grow with. So if you have a whole bunch of your seed is only halves and a few two and a half, two and three quarter ounce whole ones, maybe up to three and a half, don't cut them because you're going to have one or both pieces a little too small. So up to three and a half, leave them whole. And those in the halves are going to plant like a dream in your machines. It will literally spoil you. You just hate seeing that stuff from the bigger tubers coming later on in another load because it's, it work, the machine works so well. The bruise risk is only about a third as high on a half, a four ounce tuber cut in half, as it is a piece out of a large tuber, say a 10 ounce one, where you have three cut sides. You got all those edges and corners where bruises can occur. That, on an average two ounce piece, that's about 16 linear inches of fragile tissue. On that two ounce, or that four ounce whole potato, you cut it in half, you got about six inches, linear inches of edge and no corners. So you got a third less risk of bruise, which means a third less risk of seed decay, which means you may not need as much seed protectant because your challenge isn't as great. So you might be able to save a little money there. Uh, don't go off label, or, or if you have a problem, nobody's gonna wanna talk to you. Stay on label, but uh, you might be able to get by on the lower end of that rather than the maximum rate that's allowed. And again, look at the weather year and what the field conditions are like. Water in your soil at planting time is very, very important. Water 
contains more oxygen than the air does. The air is about 70% nitrogen, a few other gases, and, and oxygen. Water has two hydrogens. Their atomic weight is one. Oxygen is 16. So a molecule of water weighs 18. 16 of the 18 are oxygen. So that's like about 90% oxygen in water. That's why fish can do so well in it versus the air, which is less than 30%. So you want moisture in your ground when you plant your seed because those vapors between the soil particles are mostly oxygen. And oxygen is essential for wound healing and subarising. So you plant in dry fields, healing is not going to be very good. Plant in moist ground, not saturated, super wet, muddy stuff, but good moisture, and your seed's going to do well. What percentage of moisture in the ground is good moisture? Uh, a bare minimum, 65%. Uh, I'd be more comfortable with somewhere in the 70s. Once you get to about 85, you're getting too wet. You're going to start making uh, mud balls or, or clods or something that's going to be a problem getting them out of the digger at the end of the year. So somewhere in the 70s is a pretty good number. Now, where you don't have irrigation capability, that's kind of hard to manage because the rains may come or they may not. And uh, so depending on what the weather's doing, your fields might be in real good shape or not so good. And that might mean changing your routine. Your heavier ground will hold moisture better than your sandier ground. So if you've got wet conditions, go plant the sandy ground. The Biucus blocks work. Uh, the tensiometers work. Uh, more reliable tools, the watermark sensor and the neutron probes. Neutron probes are quite expensive and you have to have nuclear license to operate them. Uh, usually that's done by a consulting firm that will go out and check your moistures and they do that where they irrigate. I don't know that you have anybody here set up to do that. But the watermarks are a little thing you bury in the ground and it's got a couple wire leads, you plug it into an instrument and it tells you what's going on. They're not very expensive. Oh yeah, yeah, that's like batteries. <laughs> so let's get back to the bruise on the harvester. Um, we want to run the, the ground speed so that we're filling, but not overloading, the side elevator and the boom. If you're seeing rollback, back off your ground speed a little bit because you're putting too many potatoes in at a time. And, and your brews will get better. Then once you have established a ground speed, because the yield might not be the same in every field or every variety, so that ground speed can change, then you go and start changing sprockets on your digger to get it to match the speed you're gonna run. And then you look at field conditions. Are we on the dry side? They're gonna clean up really easy, so we can go a little quicker. Or are they a little on the wet side? We're going to have to slow down and take a little more time to get that dirt separated out because we don't want to haul it to the storage. It's just a nuisance there. So there's, there's variables to figure. The secondary chain should run six tenths of your ground speed. And it should be fairly full of potatoes. Not, not piled high, but uh, you, know, you don't see a whole lot of chain when you've got a good number of potatoes on there. The rear cross, the side elevator, and the picking boom, typically at about half of ground speed, so 0.5. So it would be nice if there were hard and fast rules. You've got to run the machine at 3.15 miles an hour, and everything has to be this and this and this. But because of the variables in the field, the yield and the conditions, that doesn't work real well. 
we got to change sprockets whenever we need to. And saying, oh, I don't want to change it today, well, just go dig, can cost you hundreds of times what that sprocket was worth in damage. So it's economically, it's a very costly decision to recognize that you need to change the sprocket, but just pass it off and don't do it. So it's, it's really important to, to do that. And uh, there's different ways to uh, check those machines. I'll show you one that I use. This is a digital tachometer. It gives you an LED display of the feet per minute or the revolutions per minute that you're measuring. If you're measuring a shaft, you put this rubber tip against the end of the shaft near the center, and as it rotates, it will read out continuously how fast that shaft's turning. And then you can press a button and lock it in. So when it's running, it's, it's showing you a number. Uh, and you can lock it in so you can take it off and see what it reads because you can't always get your head in there to, to get a good look at it while it's working. If you take that off and put this wheel on, this is 3.1417 inches in diameter. Anybody recognize that number? That's pi. So if you lay this on a belt, it will read out in feet per minute exactly how fast that belt's running. So it's very useful on belted chain. You can just stick it right on the chain and see, or you can go back to the shaft and then get the diameter of that sprocket and calculate it that way. So there, there's more than one way to do it. This is also very helpful in all the rest of your equipment. Belt speeds should never exceed 105 feet per minute. Then you exceed the threshold of elasticity of the cells, so when potatoes hit, they're traveling too fast and they cause damage. That's especially true where you're changing directions. So um, the, when we go through and time equipment, when a grower asks me to come out and, and check their equipment, see if anything needs to be adjusted or changed, We'll start with the truck belt. What's the speed of that belt running at? And most of the time we find, well, this one's 140 feet, this one's 83, and that one's 91, and this one's 110. There aren't any two of them the same. Because the gearboxes are different that drive those belts. And uh, they're expensive. So growers will go back and say, okay, we've we got to bite the bullet. We've got to get the same gearbox in every one of these trucks. Because if one of them is running 130 and the other one's running 80 something, you've got half a load or twice as much into the next piece of receiving equipment and you're either overloading or underloading it so you're not running at capacity as much of the time as you should. And that's a problem. So you want to be sure that uh, your equipment is running at capacity, but not exceeding it, because there's penalties for that. So coming out of the truck, we don't want to go over 105 feet a minute, and uh, in some cases, quite a bit slower than that. Depends on how wide the belt is in the truck, and how big a pile is coming out through the gate, and what you're putting it into. You might be overloading the next piece of equipment. So you gotta look at that and make sure that all these things are kinda in line or compatible with each other. Then you come off the truck into the stingers and maybe you have a, a cleaning apparatus like some of the Spudnik or other brands of, of gear that has a lot of roller tables to drop out dirt and debris and so forth. And uh, all that has to be matched for speed. And you come out of that onto conveyors, and you may use conveyors to get your crop into the, where the piler sits, all of those belts need to be the same. And rarely are they. You can just lay this right on the belt and read what it's doing and step to the next one and read it and go all the way down the line. So at 100, if you use the number, 105 feet a minute is your maximum. And if you're not 
not changing directions and that's conveying containers onto another belt at the same speed. Right. Uh, are you, are then you're good. The, that part's okay. Yeah. If one belt is feeding faster than the next one's taken away, you got a jamming point. And that's going to cause a lot of damage because every potato is subject to that compression effect. If everyone's progressively a little faster, you got them spread out. But we know that when you don't have a full load in the belt, you got potatoes moving around and hitting each other. So we want to keep all our conveying mechanisms at or near capacity. Not overloaded, but not under. And so that means balancing all that equipment in conjunction with the trucks, the cleaning device, and the piler. So if there's a weak link somewhere, maybe the piler is a little undersized for the other gear, then you gotta slow all that down so you don't overload the piler. So any shaft marker with, with a wheel that's 3.14 That's feet per minute, yeah. And there's, there's a lot of different brands of these out there. there this is not the only one for sure. Uh, I've been using this one for about 30 years, so it still works. But uh, so you want to make sure that equipment is all timed for speed. And then you want to look at drop points. If your belts go one direction and they change and go off at a different angle, we need a belt letdown with a tapered bottom so that you're putting potatoes over on that side and over on this side of this new one going this way, not all on one side. So if it comes down square, they're all going to be here, nothing over there. So you're, you're going to be overloaded on one side and, and underloaded on the other. So you put your belt on a diagonal so that potatoes make it clear across it. So if you've got a nice balanced flow on the full width of your equipment, you're at maximum capacity. And that's really what you want. Then uh, when you get to the piler, the pilers have a, a bowl or an angled surround at the bottom of them. And that was put there in case the delivering equipment was still running but the piler stopped. So you don't have a big pile of potatoes on the floor to pick up later. Well, if you wire all your equipment together so it either all runs or all stops, you don't have that issue. And to address that, let me see if I can draw a view looking down from it. If we're looking at a piler that's, that's feeding this way, this is the elevator that's going up, and the bottom has this big funnel that uh, comes down here. What we found works really well. There's steel under this and then there's some rubber cushioning. And it's rubber cushioning most of the time that looks like this. It's a closed cell urethane foam. And it's pretty good cushion for impacts and it wears pretty well. It'll last four or five years. So it's a good product for that. But we cut the steel here and here and we remove this piece. We leave the cushioning there. So when that's gone, let me draw another picture from the side. Here's our, our truck bed. And Here's our, our piler funnel, and then the elevator's going uphill. We can bring this truck bed, let me make it a little longer, right down to here. So the way this is, you're looking at about an 18 inch drop. There's no potatoes out there except the little tiny ones that are fine with that without damage. The little tiny ones aren't the ones that are important to you. It's the bigger ones. So if you put that down here, this rubber that's here kind of lays back here. It, it stretches a little bit. And it doesn't wear the bottom of the belt out because it's softer than the belt. 
and every two or three years you have to replace that rubber. It's probably $25, $30, so it's not a big item. But to cut that drop from here to here to that distance is, is a real important thing. And then when you get to the top of that elevator, there's another drop there and another bowl. Put a let down belt so that they slide down it, not free fall. Because most pilot chain doesn't have a whole lot of cushioning on it. So when it hits, it hits something pretty hard and that causes damage. Then at the end of the boom, the pilot operator, whoever that happens to be, uh, has a huge influence on how much of a drop there is off the end of that boom. If he's paying attention, he can keep that boom within six inches of the pile face all day long. But if he's doing, trying to do other things, that might not be the case. So let's talk about that part a little bit. So we've got a, a floor on our storage here. And our pile is pile like this. And we've got some tubes underneath it for ventilation. Now when the piler boom swings from one side of the storage to the other, as quick as it hits that wall, reverse it. Never let the boom sit over there and fill a corner. Because what that does, all the dirt that's fallen away from those potatoes in the process of getting up the piler is going to end up in a dirt cone right there in the pile. That's where your hot spots are going to come from. So never let a piler boom stop. Swing it over, come back. Swing it over, come back. Keep it moving all the time. And if you've got a corner that you're having trouble filling, move it back and forth over to spread that dirt out. Just two or three feet back and forth. Now, the height of these tiers, again, we're looking at this distance don't exceed three feet. So you can't build an 18 foot pile with four tiers. It takes six or seven. But if your piler boom is swinging all the time, it's not a problem to do that because you're just shortening the boom to, if you're filling up here, you shorten the boom a little bit and you're filling here, you shorten again, fill it here, here. And these bigger pilers with their longer booms, you don't have to move the whole machine, but just every once in a while. You can build several patterns like that before you have to move the whole machine. So, the, uh, I'm looking for a, a bin like here, but it, if the storage of potato is 16 feet high, how many shelves do you suggest you would take? Is that a fair question? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say between five and six. The, the smaller the roll down, the less the risk of damage. So again, you spend all that money to grow that crop. You don't want to mess it up at the last minute because you can't make it go away. The damage you do is there permanently. It is. It's, it's almost impossible. You just can't see over the horizon what's going on there. So they have remote control devices that they run the piler with. I mean, you probably have those too. Uh, so that man gets, he stops everything. He gets up on top of the pile, walks up the, the piler itself, carrying that uh, remote control with a cord. And uh, he stands up there and, and they finish the tops. And then they start down the next ones and he comes back down to the floor and works his way down the face and maybe after two or three he's back up on top again. Is there any example where uh, something simple uh, that, uh, that depends on uh, the older we get, the more reasons we should stay on a flat surface? And uh, is there, is there uh, in the system lift, you know, uh, 
scissor lift that work on a cement floor can, and if you lift that up, you would still be 16 feet from the end of the floor. Oh yeah, yeah. Does that give you enough height? I'm just trying to think of things. That if if you could bring a, one of those boom lifts, the man lifts like the genies or the blue ones or, or any other color, um, up there so he can get high enough to see what's going on at the end of that boom, um, he can't get right on top of the pile unless it's quite a long boom one, but he can get up close enough he can pretty well see everything that's happening and, and do a nice job. A lot of places here in Alabama, I've seen them just sitting up on extension ladders. They have, they have like a, a high extension ladder, mm -hmm. and the guy just, will just sit up there for a while before it then comes down. Yeah. Just keep moving yeah. along. It's cheaper than getting lifted or something. Oh, there's also the catwalks, too. Yeah. 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 The cords are long enough on their own, so you can get up in the catwalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just have to be able to see it so you know what's happening, and then you can adjust as, as you go. So if you do get a few ripples in the pile, those big arcs, then they put people up there with lots of padding on their hands and knees and feet and, and they spread those potatoes out and level them up. Because that affects the airflow. When you've got a pile top like this and you've got these little ridges, when the air is moving this way, it's doing this on its way back to the fan house. So these vortexes tend to get wet. And when they get wet, we get sprouting issues, we got decay issues, we got problems we don't need to be dealing with. And so the amount of potatoes you're going to move up here, if the piler did a nice job of it, is maybe 10, 12 inches at most. You know, just push those to your hands and, and you've done all you need. You mentioned earlier if you don't have air movement up, you, you put the fans up there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, years ago when I was responsible for about 200,000 tons of storage, it was 23 buildings, we put hooks into the ceiling and our fans had a short piece of chain on them. So there was two hooks here and one behind it. So we could tip that fan on an angle with a bottom chain to tip it if we wanted the air to go steep, like right at the end of the pile where you got that sloping face. We want air to go down there. We don't want that dead airspace on the ends of the buildings. So we're going to make that turbulent. But again, you don't want high velocity air. You want high volume, low velocity. And so we could move these fans around by just picking them off the hooks and taking them to another spot and putting them up where we needed them. Well, that's, that's a function of your pulley. You can put an anemometer in front of it and see what your velocities are. So you can change to a bigger or smaller pulley. It would be a, uh, it'd be a, a pulley driver. Yeah. And, and most of them ran on, on 440 volt because we had the plug-ins in the storage for the pilers. So we just ran our fans down and plugged them into those same outlets. No special wiring. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, depending on the blade and, and the model and so forth. Uh, yeah, they're not hurricane velocity type systems. And those, those rubber or plastic flagging ribbons will tell you a great deal about how uniform the air movement across the pile top is. And if you've got dead air spaces, aim a fan over that direction a little bit. It'll take care of it. Because problems do develop when there's there's a problem with airflow. Oops, excuse me. So if we discussed the concerns on the, the harvester sufficiently, is there any questions on that? Uh huh. Combine them with wing rollers, got no rubber on them. Is that an issue? Well, 
a cushion makes quite a difference. Yeah, it's, not uh, a it's kind of like when you go to bed at night, would you like to lay on a rock or a pillow? Yeah. <laughs> uh, coated chain is gentler on the crop than is uncoated chain. So the ones that have the rubber surface on them are yeah, going to have, yeah, uh, the, the same kind of damage can occur on either machine because we're doing about the same thing with them. We're just getting rid of them onto the ground with a windrower or we're putting them in the truck with a few more chains on the digger. And so I would put coated chain on the rear cross of all of them because that's a drop point off the primary, and there's usually a fairly good drop there, 10, 10, 11, 12 inches, depending on the brand, and that's enough to cause some damage. And dam damage is money. Give an example like that, and this is where the discussion starts, but I'm not sure. I don't know the answer, because that's what I want to say to you. Okay. But in this example, and, and that's accurate, in the last few years, that's the way the manufacturer built them and convinced us that that part was okay. The primary is, excuse me, the divider is laid on the secondary. And, the, and then, as it flows back, the divider then picks itself up out of the, out of the potato flow. Okay. Out of the potatoes. And I guess that's, that's the that is where the discussion lies of whether it's as important for the divider to be covered. And in, in fact, it's also, I, I, I get lost there on that because, okay. because, because of that process. Well, any place that there's a drop of sufficient height to get a velocity quick enough to cause an energy of impact that breaks cells is a bruise site. And uh, yeah, the chains aren't cheap. I mean, they're expensive. But um, if you have, if that rear cross happens to be the same width as your one side of your primary chain, you may be able to use it there, depending on what the pitch is. So I the, it's the divider chain itself. That's yeah, the yeah. If you were to take that off and put on a coated chain that had cushioning to it, then yeah. can you use that other chain somewhere else? That's the. Well, the answer is no, but that doesn't mean we should move to this. So okay. Yeah, All right. I, I, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm coming back to the, the divider. Our the pitch between the rocks is uh, is uh, oh no, it's that far. I, I don't. Yeah, the divider's probably eight to ten inches. Yeah, it's but it's it's but whatever it is. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the divider is coated. That's Most the one of them. That's not oh, it isn't. That's okay. The, just so I think we have the here. That's what All right. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the rods that are four inches apart. Okay. All right. Six inches apart there. That's the one that's not coated. And as the machine runs, you, you talked about that earlier today, where the primary delivers back on the secondary. It's mm -hmm. important that the divider be start on top of the secondary. Right. Laying right on it. And yeah. That's what. That's where this is. And then as as it proceeds. As it conveys back, the divider comes up away from the secondary. That's right. That's mm -hmm. the belt he's talking about. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. If that divider chain is not coated, if this is your secondary and this is a rod of diviner and you drop a potato right on that rod, pretty good chance it's going to be damaged. And so about, uh, I'm going to say, one out of four falls is going to hit a rod. The other three are going to be between, and then the next one is going to hit a rod, and then three between, and or something on that order. And uh, so those are going to occur, for the most part, on the side of the tuber, because they don't turn endwise to drop. They usually fall, they're laying that way. But you want to be sure that you're dropping your soil out on that primary so that you can virtually see all those potatoes in that last little bit of the top of the primary. You don't want soil bearing those potatoes because that's extra weight when they fall to the secondary, whether they hit that rod or not. They've got the weight of the tuber, which is enough sometimes to bruise them, and then you add the weight of the soil, 
and that clearly exceeds the limit. And so you get a lot more damage when you're carrying soil, but you don't see it. Like we talked about earlier, that this idea of soil being a cushion. Well, the soil, the chain is designed for soil to fall through it. So the potatoes come down and rest on the chain. And there's no cushioning between the potato and the chain at that point. So you've got soil on top, and when they make a transition to the next part of the machine, that extra weight is on top when it falls, and it's still on top when they land. And, and that raises the risk of damage. You know, some will be damaged, some won't. But any is too many. <laughs>